my response to sin is regret, not repentance. You want to know if you are not living a surrendered life? Look at what you do with sin when you sin. Look at what Peter did at the end of this chapter or the verse we read. Verse 62. He went outside and he wept bitterly. That's his response to his sin. Looks pretty good to me. He seems broken over it. He seems upset over it. He seems contrite over it. He went outside and he wept bitterly. You know what Peter's experiencing in this moment? Regret. But he is not demonstrating repentance. Because right in front of him is his Lord that he could look at and say, I was wrong. I do follow him. Around this fire are people who have heard him deny Jesus. And he can look at them and say, I was lying. I was being fake. I do follow him as Lord. But what does he do instead? He walks away and he weeps bitterly. This is the hurdle we have to begin to hop over and realize if we are going to advance in our relationship with Jesus. And that's feeling bad over sin is one thing, but if you just feel bad over sin and never turn away from sin, you'll find yourself living in a cycle of shame your entire life. Man, I hate the person that I am. I hate that I did that. I hate that I said that. I hate that I looked at that. I hate that I drank that. I hate that I used that, whatever it is. And I hate the thing that I've done. And again, if we don't deal with sin and take it to the cross in repentance, we find ourselves not just hating what we've done, but when shame steps in, what we've done becomes who we are. So who do we end up hating? Ourselves. What better way could the enemy keep you in bondage? If you've given your life to Jesus, he can't touch you. He can't kill you. He would if he could, but he can't. So what can he do instead? He can freeze you in paralysis. Because if I can get you so consumed with all the ways that you're falling short, you'll never see the abundant life that Jesus has for you. If I can get you like Peter just to walk away and weep bitterly, then I can get you to not be the man that God's called you to be. And in this moment, Peter's not. He's not the man God called him to be. And the next morning, Jesus is going to be crucified. And you know who's not at the cross? Peter. But about a month later in this story, something really interesting happens. The man who's denying Jesus around total strangers and the man who wouldn't even stand present with Jesus at the cross. A month later, he stands up after Jesus' death and resurrection. He stands up in the middle of this same city in Jerusalem. And he's not around a few people around a fire. He's now standing around thousands of people who are there for a religious observance feast. He stands up in front of this crowd. And you want to know what he says to them? He says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. After the end of a very long sermon, he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Wait a minute. This is the man who said he didn't know Jesus. This is the man who said he wasn't affiliated with Jesus. And now he's saying that this man, Jesus, is Lord and Messiah. He's God himself. Keep reading. And when the people heard this, they were cut to their hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Okay, Peter, how do you go from denying Jesus around a couple strangers to standing in front of thousands proclaiming the gospel? How do you go from a life that is not surrendered to a life where we will see in this moment and all the subsequent moments is surrendered completely to Jesus? How do you have those two things happen? You have a moment in between where everything shifts. And that moment is found in the last conversation Jesus has with Peter on earth, after his resurrection and before his ascension into heaven. And in this last interaction, we see the shift that happens to complete surrender. It's in John 21. Wow, the verse is on the screen. Jesus met Peter just like he did before on the water. Same thing happens. He catches a bunch of fish with him. Interesting that Peter in his shame, leaves his calling as a disciple and he goes back to fishing. Jesus meets him there. When they had eaten breakfast, because they took advantage of the revenue on the beach this time, 
Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That these could be the fish, that these could be the disciples around him. The question is, do you love me, Peter? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. Another way of talking about how he should lead in the church. And the second time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Okay, okay shepherd my sheep, he told him. One more time, he's going to say this. A third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time. He was upset. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. He's grieved by this line of questioning. Why? Because in this moment, the word of God is challenging something in Peter. And I'll be honest with you. It grieves you and I the same way when we get challenged like this. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, meaning it pierces you when it goes in, but it heals you as it comes out. This is the first time that he is having a conversation with Peter one-on-one after his resurrection. Other times he's been with the other disciples. He's been talking to them. This is just him and Peter now. And he doesn't look at him and say, Peter, what were you doing, bro? Peter, why did you deny me? Peter, I told you this was going to happen. Why didn't you trust me? No, he asks him one question three times. What's the question? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And that's what hurts. Because Jesus' love for you is never in question. But if I could humbly say this, your and my love for him is always in question. And Jesus is showing him in this moment, Peter, here's the problem. Surrender is not a living problem. Surrender is a loving problem. And the reality is, Peter, you will be surrendered. You will be completely given over to what you love the most. So Peter, what do you love the most? South Tampa Fellowship, what do you love the most? Moms and dads, what do you love the most? What do I love the most? Because what I love the most will order the way that I live my life. My heart always affects my hands. And we have to recognize that sometimes our biggest problem in this world is not more complicated than the fact that we have disordered loves. I love the right things in the wrong order. You can love your family and love your kids and love your career and love where you live. But if you love those things over and above your love for Jesus, you will not find yourself surrendered to him. I can find myself loving our church and loving preaching and loving leading and loving pastoring. But if I love those things more than I love Jesus, I will find myself using a church to build my kingdom and not his. We all can do this. Even a guy who walked on water. So the question for us is, will we be a people who decide to love Jesus above all else and to cultivate that love above all else so that we can be a people who are completely surrendered?